Okay, thank you everybody so much for joining us today. We're so glad to have you here for our April session. Today, we're going to be talking about Into the Unknown Information Management in the Next Normal. We have a wonderful uh, guest speaker with us today. So coming to you, uh, let's do a few introductions. We have uh, Michael Hughes, who's coming to us from London, UK. We have myself, Tanya Anderson, coming in from Vancouver, BC. And then of course, we have the wonderful Richard Hulzer, who's coming to us from West Hollywood. So uh, we wanted to thank you all for joining us in our uh, educational webinar series that we've been putting on during the pandemic. And uh, Michael, why don't you tell us a little bit about Sutron Global and uh, the efforts we've been doing? Yeah, sure, happy to, Tanya. Thank you very much. So on the next slide, you'll have a, a very brief introduction um, for those of you that are new to this series about Sutron Global. Uh, in essence, Sutron Global is a cloud-based library knowledge and information management solution provider dedicated to working with information professionals to manage library transformation. How we do that, you can see on the next slide where there are um, brief introductions to the various different systems uh, in our artillery um, and that we deploy to help people um, manage and disseminate the information to their audience. Uh, increasingly now, disparate, distributed, hybrid, um, all of these terms we might hear Richard mention as we move through this session and they all come into play um, with our software um, to enable and facilitate access and better access and more easy access to information um, to audiences um, under management by the info pros that we work with. Um, on the next slide, a little bit more information about how you can follow us and learn a bit more about us um, via our various uh, social media channels uh, and also our website. Uh, but I don't want to spend too much time on us. Um, before we just hand, hand over to our speaker today, um, it is worth noting that Richard, um, as he will tell you, is, is um, some of his stories are very good and very interesting, but um, he is actually a, a, a pioneer really when it comes to, to working remotely and, and in hybrid situations uh, in the corporate world, as we'll hear. Um, he kind of invented some of this stuff back in the day, I think. Um, so it's um, with great pleasure that I'll hand you over to our speaker, Richard, who will um, tell us a little bit more about this and deliver the session that we're all here for today. Richard, the floor is yours. Thank you. Okay. Uh, can everyone hear me? Uh, just checking, Michael, just to make sure uh, I'm yep, on. loud and clear, Richard, loud and clear. Uh, great. Thank you. Uh, Hi everyone, uh, welcome. I uh, appreciate uh, you joining us today. And uh, let me tell you briefly about me. Uh, I am a uh, right now an independent library and archives consultant, and I help my clients mine, preserve, and market historical jewels from their files, as I like to say. I help them uh, organize their history and help them promote it. So, uh, but I've worked in uh, many environments similar to yours. Um, many years ago, for those of you in the law environment, I actually worked for a lawyer service in New York City. Uh, and so I've been in courthouses uh, doing a lot of the nitty gritty, pulling files and making photocopies and all that kind of stuff to deliver to the attorneys uh, that you probably deal with on a regular basis. Uh, and uh, many years ago. And uh, so I'll be talking a little bit about something to that effect because my nephew works for that company now, and uh, I had an interview with him over the weekend. But I've also worked in uh, corporate environments, uh, in information uh, management uh, for libraries and museums, uh, and um, around the country and around the world, actually, at one point. And I've worked in biotech, uh, uh, the computer industry, uh, my more recent organizational experience was with the Natural History Museum here in Los Angeles for a number of years, working, uh, supervising the library and archives and revamping it. So uh, I may get into one or two questions like that because I know some of you are from those environments. All right. So into the unknown, information management in the, what's called the next normal, which comes from, I believe, McKinsey Consulting is the one, is the organization or someone like them who coined that not the new normal, but the next normal. So let's get into it. Oh, uh, I don't have access to the um, changing the screens, Michael. Uh, Sorry, Richard, one second and we'll address that for you. Okay. So uh, since we don't know what's the future, the, here's this graphic to show you that, that uh, just to give you a visual on that little fancy colors. 
and uh, I'm still not uh, able to go forward. Um, so could you go to the next screen, please? All right, where are we right now? So uh, right now, as we all know, unfortunately, the economic impact of the pandemic is worldwide and across every sector, every fabric, uh, personally and organizationally. Uh, organizations have been tightening budgets. Uh, they've been rethinking projects, stopping projects, putting them on hold, uh, maybe permanently stopping them. Uh, they've been reducing, reorganizing, or even eliminating staffing. And uh, I think one of the key things for all of us uh, in the information business is the supply chain disruptions. Now, we all know this personally from the goods, uh, particularly everything from the uh, sanitizers to uh, um, toilet paper to everything else. And uh, just, uh, I will tell you, just getting a lamp I ordered from a, a, a lighting company the other day, we're at the mercy of FedEx, uh, who held the materials for five days with no movement, and they finally are going to deliver it, maybe even today. So, but it's a guess. So, uh, it's one of those things. But services for you all, I think, is really key. Uh, an example uh, that maybe you can relate to is digitization services, and and how important that will be in a minute. But with what I do. Uh, with uh, getting materials up on the web and digitized. As we know, not everything is digital yet. Uh, there are, they're all backed up and they've had restrictions and shutdowns just like anybody else. So access to uh, the equipment and the ability to timely uh, digitize materials is just out the window. And so that really uh, has a rolling effect on ability to do projects. Uh, and so I'll get into that in a few minutes. So what I'd like you to do is, as I go through some of these key things, uh, that I'd like you to think about you personally and also your organization and how uh, things are going. Because as you see with the uh, image I have in the lower left, there's risk uh, involved across the board, but you know companies are looking at profit and loss. If you're in an a cultural institution and whatnot, you don't have profit per se, but you do have revenue streams because people have to be paid and how do they get paid? It's uh, memberships, it's uh, attendance uh, money if you charge people to get into your institution, that kind of thing. Uh, it's grants that may be on hold right now from all sorts of organizations, so we've got that. Uh, next slide, please. So, uh, I'm going to quote some things from McKinsey and Company, but as you'll see in the resources list later, uh, I'm, I'm, uh, there's a number of different organizations like the Boston Consulting Group, Forrester, uh, some other smaller uh, uh, consulting companies, some in the law arena as well. Uh, and so some, some of the uh, principles I'm talking about today are extracted from those articles and uh, webinars and other resources. Uh, which you'll have access to. Uh, so uh, in this case, McKinsey uh, had an article where they talked about making it work. And this was a year ago, just about, but the principles are still there. Uh, other resources that I'm gonna talk to are much more current, but these are pretty much the same. Making it work in, in the next normal. Uh, first of all, they talk about concentrate. Concentrate on effect remote working. Now they're talking to the senior execs in organizations. So one of the key things to think about is we don't know. Nobody knows what's going to happen tomorrow, let alone in five months, let alone next year. We all think we know we're going to be flexible about it. And we're going to hope for the best and plan for the worst. And unfortunately, as folks in India and folks in Jordan uh, and in the UK and Canada, and Michigan and some other places, it's it's pretty horrific right now. Uh, and in other places like California, it's not too bad, but we're fearful and wary uh, because we're not sure if we might things might change as easy as two days from now. So, first thing is concentrate on effective remote working. What makes uh, it effective? Uh, the second thing is to focus on practices across the organization, and this could be within your department. If you are in your information center, if you have uh, a staff of people, or if you are like me oftentimes and you are a solo worker, 
still your own personal practices to speed up decision making and execution what's the best way to make that happen uh, expanding into a contact-free economy and we all know that from the drop-off services that uh, for groceries or other goods or for live public libraries dropping off having uh, bags in front of the front door of my public library so I could get uh, the book or the CD that I'm borrowing from the library and then emphasizing their returning and reimagining business in the next normal whatever that may be uh, so it's really broadly opening your mind as to what it could be which by the way we all have been doing a lot of these kinds of things all along and some of you who are in the biotech industry and in, in the high-end research industries uh, have been doing some of these things for more than a decade but now the technology and the broad uh, sensibility of the general public is catching up to to what we've been trying to promote so next slide please uh, so what are the trends? Okay, again, uh, this happens to be a McKinsey thing, but uh, but I noticed this across many, many resources. Obviously, 2021 is the year of transition. And this was said back in January, but it obviously is. We're only partway through it, but we see it. Uh, lots of different things are going on. And in fact, uh, last week I was in a conference for consulting information professionals, and we had a uh, an economist from the Federal Reserve in the U.S., speak to us and gave us the options of the best case scenarios, worst case scenarios and everything in between with no statement on which way it's gonna go. They think they're gonna, they, we should all be cautiously optimistic, but that could change tomorrow. So it's a year of transition. So the crisis has sparked waves of innovation. And according to the analysis that these consulting companies have done, it's launched a generation of entrepreneurs. Now, there's a bunch of us who are already entrepreneurs. And in fact, Sutron Global started out that way too, right? Entrepreneur, uh, Tony and team, uh, a growing organization. So, but there's a lot more innovative things either due to layoffs or due to, gee, it's time for me to do a change or other circumstances, but lots of creativity, lots of use of technology. A year and a half ago, very few people knew what Zoom meant. Uh, as far as technology, now it's become a running uh, commentary even on Saturday Night Live and other TV shows. So um, next uh, item is digitally enabled productivity gains are accelerating the fourth industrial revolution, which is the use of technology uh, for everyday uh, uses. Uh, we're truly uh, something that was going on from the 50s and 60s with the beginnings of computers into uh, where we are today where it's ubiquitous in everyday life uh, you know talking to Alexa or other voice activated systems uh, and that kind of thing which uh, I'll talk about in a few minutes also and companies now they're finding are three times more likely to conduct at least 80 percent of their customer interactions digitally now that's by force right now, but there's the way people are looking at it is, why can't that continue? If that's effective, isn't that a better way to do it? Uh, you know, texting on my phone with the lighting company uh, instead of going to the retail store was uh, actually just almost as effective as being in the store uh, in some in some parts of it. So so that's what's happening. So with that in mind. Uh, people are really thinking, well, how much of this is going to be maintained? So let's go to the next slide, please. Uh, now, from a law perspective, uh, you know, I, and uh, the icon on the left um, above trends, uh, hope you enjoy that. Uh, but uh, there's, and this is a, uh, actually true across all sectors, virtual platform security is critical. We know this uh, from in the political situations in different countries, including the US, where security breaches have happened, or with banks where there and, and other financial institutions or other kinds of institutions where you get the notice that we've had a security breach and your personal information might have been taken, that kind of thing. So so that's an issue. Uh, the next is that uh, communications effectiveness is uh, according to a lot of the attorneys. Uh, it's really a strategic leadership issue and should not be left to IT or HR. Gee, what a concept. Absolutely, it should be a strategic leadership issue, 
because uh, face it, uh, meetings and whatnot, could they be run more effectively? You betcha, uh, and, and we'll talk about that in a second. Uh, at the same time, people are realizing work-life work -life balance, which we talked about prior to the pandemic, but, but now people are seeing an improvement in some cases. And of course, if you're at home with several kids and, and partner and other people in your household and pets and the cat walking across the keyboard when you're trying to do a virtual meeting, maybe the work-life balance isn't so great sometimes or certain parts of the day or the kids are zoomed out from all of their classes online. But that's added an added perspective for both employers and employees uh, as to, gee, uh, maybe this is a new way to look at things. And related to that is the physical and emotional well-being of, of everybody uh, becoming a priority, which should always be the case, but it's now becoming more of a priority because of uh, the positive and negative impacts of everything we're dealing with. And lastly, uh, one of the trends that I've added uh, uh, from different talks and whatnot are artificial intelligence and voice marketing are into future expansion. And artificial intelligence, whether we know it or not, is already there. It's under the covers with even our Google searches and Bing searches and others like that. Uh, they may be in products and services that you're using. Uh, think of when you call or or text any uh, helpline, chances are you're talking to a machine and you get frustrated really quickly if you're like me because uh, there's no way to get out of it and talk to a human being so you could have a conversation about, no, that's not really what I want to do. I want to talk to you about something a little nuanced and different. And uh, um, uh, Emily Binder is a person you should check into. She's a uh, founder of wealthvoice.ai. Uh, she last week gave us a talk on voice marketing. So you know those voice activated systems that are now in some of your homes. I don't have one yet for a couple of reasons, but uh, like the Alexas of the world and others, uh, the next step is instead of podcasting, as she points out, uh, it's really going to be uh, voice marketing, where snippets of, of voice casting on those systems are gonna happen. So yes, look out right now, you're able to talk to that machine and, or that whatever entity and have it turn on your television or do whatever. Uh, soon you're gonna get commercials that way and get into the spamming of us in our homes in addition to our phones and elsewhere. So just buckle up buttercup because here it's coming. Um, and so that's something to think about. But artificial intelligence really is really coming into uh, ubiquity, if you will, uh, in many ways. It's a lot of advances uh, to it. So uh, let's keep that in mind. Going to the next screen, please. So in law firms and courts, uh, the next normal there, what's happening? Well, just like other organizations, disruptions will continue making way for new business models. And law firms, according to the literature, and you all who are in law firms can tell me better than I can tell you, uh, they're looking at new ways to do business. Uh, will courts stay open? Yes, they will. Will there be trials in person eventually? Yes, as we see on TV this past week or two in the United States. Yes, there are in-person uh, trials, but they're done differently and maybe they're done through video, Zooming kind of thing, and there's some pros and cons, and there's lots of them to those. And there's uh, privacy issues and security issues and um, rights issues that involve with that. So uh, going to the next point is technology investments will drive competitiveness. So law firms are realizing this, Courthouses, who the people who work there realize it, but as we all know, those are pretty slow in getting things moving along uh, and, and getting things uh, electronic and digitized. They're, in certain areas, it, it's getting better than others, but that will drive competitiveness. So the advantage of using technology, and one of the uh, consulting uh, things that I've done in the past uh, is strategic technology planning. That's not helping select a specific product, but helping understand how technology can enhance how you operate and do your business more effectively. 
And that is critical to be done. And so if there's ever a time we should be using this quote unquote downtime, and some people it's not a downtime at all, uh, is now to figure out, not just throw in the technology and put a bunch of money into it, but figure out where it's gonna work best and how effectively, and working with partners like Sutron Global folks and others, uh, you can uh, talk to them about, here's what I'm trying to do, how can your products and services help me make that happen, and then some in an affordable way, in a proper way, for the way we work, et cetera, et cetera. So as a result of that, technology adoption will accelerate and is accelerating. People are finally realizing, gee, technology can help me do things. Again, a lot of us information pros uh, who have been using technology know this already, uh, and maybe now the senior management will, will understand what we're trying to say. And uh, from the law firm perspective, uh, I've read where they're talking about the nimble firm will prevail. Well, actually, that's true uh, across the board. You know, Google started out very tiny in the 1990s. And it was nimble, it was fast, it, it took advantage of things, and it uh, superseded a lot of their competitors because of that. Now it's become huge, uh, much like Apple was at one time, uh, much like Microsoft was at one time, same thing. Uh, so uh, firms and courts will settle into this new normal, as it's said in the literature, but I'm calling the next normal, uh, virtual and hybrid work. So either 100% virtual or a hybrid of some virtual and some in person. And a colleague of mine who works in a law library was telling me about um, uh, a Law 360, which some of you may be familiar with, and a recent study that said that Gen Z law students are saying no thanks to 100% in-person work. They'd rather work either part or full-time virtually. Uh, so you have a generation that's looking at, well, there's viable options and why can't I work that way? So I alluded or I talked briefly earlier about lawyer services, those that are two law firms. And as I mentioned, I worked uh, for one at one time uh, going to the courthouses. And one of the key things I, I have found is that, uh, yes, there are things electronic. You can file things electronically. But now the courts are saying, nah, just you need to mail them in to us. And when we get to it, we'll get to it. So here you can envision somebody who gets stacks of mail every day on their desk, if they're even able to get to a desk. And it sits there until they get to it. And it piles up and piles up. So this year, things have probably been backlogged beyond belief. So it's going to take a while. And so, uh, but those lawyer services are changing their business models because in the old days, that would be people going in and, and retrieving documents, doing things, and also uh, then scanning them and sending them to the law firms. Uh, now it's, uh, will an attorney these days uh, or any executive want to go in and search for documents? Well, there's always one or two that do, but most of them don't. They have their teams to help them do that. Uh, and, and that's still going to be the case. So there's that going on. So what, uh, again, what's going on in your organization and how are you dealing with this? Uh, and how are you uh, planning short term and long term into where this is headed? Uh, it could go either way. So next screen, please. All right. So with that, think about how has the pandemic impacted your business and your business plans from a tactical standpoint, your day-to-day -day kind of thing. And, uh, you know, we've all had a bit of time maybe uh, thinking uh, more strategically, okay, in the long run, whatever that means to you, a year, five years, uh, government still plans five to 10 years, which boggles my mind a little bit, but uh, so strategically, where are things going? With the continued uncertainty, walking that tightrope, as uh, you see in the illustration there, uh, what changes are you making or plan to make to cope with that? You know, flexibility is uh, key, uh, being able to adjust accordingly, but, uh, and restaurants and whatnot have, have seen that happen where they were opening up a year ago and then they had to shut down again and then they opened up and had to shut down again among other organizations. And, and uh, you can't run a successful 
business that way. So what do you do? At the same time, there's great opportunities for tech savvy info pros like yourselves. Uh, if you are already tech savvy or getting there, both inside your organization and perhaps outside your organization uh, and across the board, digitization is being becoming more of a big focus because people are realizing things are not online. But you know what? As I mentioned earlier, uh, it's not going to happen overnight. It's a lot of work. And yeah, you can scan hundreds of pages in an hour. Easy. That's easy. What about the metadata to retrieve it or the optical character recognition or whatever you're going to use so that you can actually successfully get to it? That is complex. It's, it ultimately is human intensive, therefore expensive, uh, but it is what it is. And it's, it's, it's a time suck and it, it will take time and that has to be done. Um, but there's, it's a great opportunity because you need to prioritize. Well, what kinds of things need to be digitized? Can we do some of it first? What do we need? So if we go, uh, yeah, go ahead to the next screen. Thank you. Uh, that's all right. So, um, but we're all dealing with online meetings fatigue and remedies. And I'm not talking about the poor students, uh, K through uh, graduate student and postdocs that are having classes all day long online. And uh, my nephew's wife is a school teacher. She tells me all about how we, there's pros and cons for her daughters as well as uh, her students uh, in grade school. But, uh, you know, there's marathon virtual meetings and they're exhausting everybody. And they may not be necessary because, you know what, the, the bottom line is the proper way to have a good meeting is important both in the real and the virtual world. And if your organization, and, and anecdotally, I will tell you, I've talked to some people in the academic arena and corporate where their management seems to feel like they have to have their people in all these meetings virtually every day and they have back-to-back -back Zoom meetings day, day in and day out. When do they have time to get their work done? Rethink meetings for decisions, or for that quick update in you know to get that visual contact with your colleagues or supervisor or employees but email or letter for information only a lot of stuff that could be transmitted that way could be done and then utilize information management systems such as the one sponsoring this talk today uh, that can streamline your processes and enable access to new and productive ways um, to information. So really take advantage of it. Really set back, think about, are you using it most effectively? Are you uh, getting the information in so that you can access it and pull it out? Or are you linking to other pieces of information better? Is there a different way to do it? And you know, with all of that, one of the key things is licensing costs, especially in the corporate world. I've been there, done that, spent millions of dollars a year with different uh, providers. Uh, and they are still in the old model of how they price things and they're getting religion as you will or getting uh, reoriented, but I don't know that they're there yet. Uh, and the same with access um, to by public libraries, for instance, to electronic books by a certain A company uh, that we all know um, and being restricted to be able to do that. Uh, those are challenges. Uh, there's no answer except discussion and as groups uh, saying hey this is not tenable this is not workable we need a different way to do this and so that's worthy of discussion uh, go ahead to the next um, screen so what i would suggest to you is you need a vision and a plan of action to achieve success and what you want to think about is what are your action plans to make that uh, reality so if you go to the next screen, uh, I have a whole bunch of resources that's for you to access later. Take Use those links. These are uh, the more general ones that are, are a lot of these are from consulting firms and they're talking about the big organizations that you may be in or you may deal with. And it's important to take what they're talking about and then bring it to your departmental level and think about it that way. And then if you go to the next screen as well, uh, I separated out, although those could be integrated easily enough, these are the legal ones. And the first uh, resource is the 21 Legal Tech and Business of Law 
predictions for 2021 are by this uh, think tank, Adirond, but the individual entries are from everybody from Outsell Inc. to other uh, consultants, and they are quite interesting as well as some of these others. So take a look at those. If you go to the next screen, and uh, now I hope we have a few minutes for questions, uh, and hopefully that was helpful to you. So thanks. Perfect. Thank you very much, Richard. So for those of you that are new or unfamiliar with GoToWebinar, there is a normally on the right side of the screen, or of the screen rather, there is a questions section that will allow you to enter your questions for Richard, and we'll be very happy to to pose those to him. Um, we do have a couple that have come in already, uh, Richard. So while I ask you those, anybody else can go ahead and um, enter any additional queries that they may have. Um, okay. The first one, I guess, is more, more. I'll go ahead, Richard. No, go ahead. Go ahead. Oh, I'm sorry. I thought you were going to say something. Beg your no, pardon. No. Yeah, the first one is more of a general statement, really. Um, do you think that COVID has simply accelerated where we where we are, where we'd already get to? Um, would we have already reached this point in a decade or two? Do you think, in respect of hybrid working and uh, distributed environments, is a good question? Uh, yeah, that's a great question, and the answer is absolutely. Uh, you know, uh, actually, the the positive of this horrible pandemic is that it really forced people to do things that they should have done five years ago. Uh, and uh, part of it, it's just a combination, a dovetailing of things, because as I mentioned earlier, back in the 1990s, uh, when I was in the sales and marketing side of IBM, and the marketing side in particular, we had uh, a phone number. And, and we were working virtually from home uh, a lot of times, but it wasn't quite as easy. And so what what uh, this is what the pandemic has done is really forced, forced uh, people across all sectors to really rethink, gee, how could we do this differently? Because we have no choice. And, uh, and I would hope, I mean, this to me, when I worked in the museum, this would be an excellent way to say, you know, this is what I've been trying to tell you for five years, uh, senior executives. Uh, this is this is why, yes, we need to do things in person, absolutely, but there's so many other things we could do remotely or have people work on metadata or 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 work on getting that species information combined with the literature that's in the library that is uh, rare or unique and and won't be digitized tomorrow. These are things that we need to help the world focus on. In, in the corporate world, this is what's going to make business faster and better. Uh, and now people are actually realizing, oh, this can be done because we see it on TV with the news broadcasters, whichever one you happen to look at when they're interviewing people via Zoom or whatever tool they're using. So yes, I think this would have happened, but geez, 10 more years, that's where Gen Z and millennials and stuff are saying, get with it, uh, boomers and whatnot. You know, we're way ahead of you. Uh, why aren't you... Uh, getting on, uh, getting on the racetrack and getting this moving. So uh, let's see what happens. Uh, next question. Thanks, Richard. Uh, if you wanted to understand the next normal uh, to better understand the vendor landscape during and post COVID, um, what type of business or digital items would be of emphasis for info pros as they deal with vendors, so tech vendors and publishers, etc. Say that one more time, please. Sure. If you want to understand the next normal, um, to understand the vendor landscape, so I think it's a question about how to deal with vendors during and post COVID. Um, okay. What type of business or digital items would be of emphasis to info pros as they deal with vendors? Okay, there, there's a couple. Um, you know, uh, what you want to look at is uh, the day-to-day -day stuff. Uh, there's a lot of technology out there uh, and, and tools that uh, can enable you to handle uh, information because because your your users or your customers, however way you want to phrase it, are looking at face it. They just want they want it electronically, uh, and uh, how do you get that to happen? And that's a combination of uh, content management systems, knowledge management solutions such as this company Sutron Global offers so talk to them and it's a conversation it's a because the uh, having been in the research side of information systems as well uh, uh, years ago um, and helping with that 
uh, it's really understanding what are the needs and, and how that works and how that's going to make sense for you the way you do business. Uh, it's a discussion of can the technology, here's what I want to do, can the technology do it? Tell me what you have that can help me with that. What kind of uh, costs and implementation are involved? What kind of security can I do? Is a secure VPN line, which is kind of old hat by now, I would think, uh, possible and affordable and feasible? The answer should be yes, um, or other ways. Um, how can I deliver what I have uh, better or differently? And side note, if you have a bunch of physical stuff because uh, you want the presence of the library, clearly the past year has proven that is irrelevant. Uh, and so anybody who's holding on to materials just to have them take up space so it looks like uh, the library is is uh, important and usable, uh, no. The answer is just no. Don't, you know, get with it. Uh, I will tell you, uh, in, in the biotech industry I know, Years ago when I was there, we changed our library from a physical library to a complete digital one over a period of a few years. Uh, and I'm sure anyone who's in that sector right now, probably if they do have a physical collection, it's pretty small. On the other hand, I will tell you, look at the archivists and archives. Uh, senior executives understand unique and rare materials that could be useful to them, uh, make sense to them, whereas they think everything else that's published, oh, that's all available for free on the internet. No, you still have to pay for it. But especially if you're a corporate thing, uh, entity, and all of you pretty much are in one way or another. Uh, so uh, I would say uh, there's no single thing that I would recommend, but I would say talk to your vendors, think about what kinds of things you need. Hire people like me, honestly, and we'll talk to you and help you out with that. <laughs> <laughs> Good yes. idea, good idea. I've got another couple here, Richard. I'll try and squeeze in if I can. Um, do you know of companies surveying their employees about the new normal on whether or not to return to the office? And also the flip side, have you heard of any surveying of customers of how they would prefer services delivered that used to be done in person? So I guess that's thinking about your light, for example. Uh, yeah, well, for the second one, I would hope that companies are surveying their customers on how they will need to operate. And I would think that was a conversation that started immediately as with the lockdown when it was more than just gonna be a few weeks, saying, okay, this looks like it's gonna be for a while, so how can we do this? Uh, and uh, I will say that there are organizations that have been polling their, their employees and have had uh, working groups on, uh, you know, you might have read, those of you who uh, read Library Journal or other kinds of resources like that, where uh, there are teams of people looking at how do we operate with our public in a uh, COVID and post-COVID environment safely for the employees, as well as for the people coming in using our services. And I would say, uh, be observant to, um, uh, the grocery store and other places that have been trying to do this all along. Uh, uh, and uh, But yes, they, there are organizations doing that. The problem is there's a lot of committees and a lot of discussion, and I wonder where the action plans are and uh, that kind of thing. So I'll leave that as an open point and I know we're running out of time but go ahead Michael if you've got any others. Sure yeah one last one if I, if I can squeeze this one in. Um, someone's asking for tips. Do you have any sources for cost benefit ratios for digitization projects? Oh that's a great question. Uh, there are some I don't have any off the top of my head. Um, there uh, what I would say is uh, you could uh, use your skill set uh, <laughs> uh, but uh, there, there have been studies done on the cost benefit analysis. Now, you want to look at it from a quantitative and qualitative. So, uh, one of the key things is there's a uh, how much money and time and effort would it cost you to retrieve something physically versus electronically and deliver it. And if you, like we had in, uh, the corporate environments I've been in, we had multiple locations. So it was imperative that we be able to, uh, scan, in those days, scan things and then deliver them as PDFs to wherever. Uh, so uh, instead of mailing it and whatnot. So uh, 
the, the action of actually creating that PDF is digitization, right? So, but uh, you want to be careful about just in case versus just in time. And that's a whole conversation to have. But, um, and uh, like I had a conversation the other day with some people where they said, well, can't you, you know, three years ago, I asked for this particular report and I can't seem to find it on my desk because I have all these papers. Could you just send me that again? Well, that, which was gotten from an outside source. Well, that doesn't make sense. Why would you duplicate an electronic uh, box full of stuff that you'd have to organize uh, yourself internally necessarily if you could just get it again more quickly from an outside source? Uh, and I worked for a document retrieval organization, Infotrieve at the time, years ago, that is now part of uh, the CCC. But, but, and so we did that kind of stuff. But, um, but you know, you have to weigh that. So uh, I don't have one off the top of my head, sorry, but, but there are studies that have been done about that. And it actually depends on your situation. And I'm doing that with my clients right now. So if you want to talk some more about it, please contact me and maybe, you know, we can have a conversation. Perfect. Thank you ever so much, Richard. I will just throw it back over to Tanya to close the session. But um, yeah, I appreciate your views there and your insight, Richard. Thank you. Excellent. Well, uh, as you can see, uh, thank you from Richard. And here is his uh, information. It will be in the PDF of the slides that you can download on our website. So um, that will go out in the email after the session with the recording. Uh, there will be a link to download the PDF. The slides if you'd like to uh, get a hold of Richard. So once again, thank you everyone for attending and joining us today. You can reach out to Sutron Global uh, at our email here or visit our website for our new blogs that we've been posting, any news or information about the upcoming events that we'll be having. You can also follow us on social media at uh, Twitter, LinkedIn, on YouTube or Facebook um, and uh, we'll be posting all of the information about the new events and any new blogs there as well. So thank you once again everyone and uh, we'll see you hopefully for the next event. Take care until then.